If there was ever a strong reminder that the animals have the upper hand and that a really nice long range rifle doesn't necessarily make hunting any easier in all situations, this trip was it. I'd been wanting to go to Zululand for many years, not only for sort of the high standard of uh, hunting that it has to offer, but mostly just to spend some time with uh, my good friend Nico Harris. Some of you may remember Nico from uh, our earlier Vapor Trails episodes. A few years ago he came down to the Eastern Cape. We had an awesome time shooting fallow deer and a number of other things. Um, but the story really starts before that. I met him at Huntex, which is our big hunting trade show in South Africa. And we immediately started talking about low development and all the, the intricacies of precision long range shooting. I was invited up by Gino from GNG to help at their stall. Matt came by the store and, and said hi and between him and myself and Gino we started chatting and we showed each other videos and pictures and chatting about likes, dislikes, rifles, ammo, the normal stuff that never gets boring. And from there it's kind of the idea came up that I need to come out to Zululand. I'd seen all his pictures, I've, I'd seen everything he'd sent me. I've heard about the, the Zululand gong series that um, he helps to run over there. So it was just a matter of planning it and finally the plan came together. It took him to get a girlfriend that lives here to get him down here, but you know, use any means you can, so. <laughs> it was a really long drive to get to Nico. I think I was on the road for like 15 or 16 hours. <laughs> Horrible drive, but um, there was no time to relax when I got there. We only had a few days of hunting, so as soon as I got there, we unpacked my truck we went upstairs to Nico's man cave uh, spent some time admiring everything he had up there I mean obviously he's got all his reloading stuff up there um, but also a lot of trophies and when I say trophies I mean in more than one sense <laughs> he's got all the trophies of the various um, animals he shot on his farm and in other parts of the country and then also trophies from competitions that he's won including many local long-range competitions like the Zululand Gong Series, the King of One Mile, um, you know, stuff that on paper shows that Nico is a serious shooter. He's not just some hunter who claims to have shot all these animals. He knows what he's doing. And it was very clear just being in his little man cave that that was the case. We decided to fit a thermal scope, an ATN Mars to my 260 with the goal of trying to go out for a bush pig later. And you will see that later in this video. That was such an insane hunt. We hopped into Nico's truck eventually, packed all the rifles in, packed some gongs in, packed some targets in and headed up to the hills where we planned to zero the rifles and to do some trajectory validation out at long range before the hunt the next day. Yes, that is nice, eh? Yeah. A lot of the advice I got when building my 300WSM was actually from Nico. So it was nice for him to actually, for the first time, take a few shots um, with my rifle after helping so much with its build and just seeing his reactions and seeing the smile on his face. It's a caliber that we both love, so we were able to share a little moment there <laughs> in the plantation. That's perfect, eh? Spot on. Well, it's my first time uh, using a, a thermal scope. I actually uh, borrowed this. So my Titan came off the 260. We just mounted the thermal scope back at the house, it's an AT in Mars 4. It's really, really cool, but we came out here and I've no experience uh, zeroing a thermal scope and we realized, hold on a second, we need some sort of heat source at the center of that box if we want to zero it. So Nico just stuck a little stick in there and lit it. So we had a, a heat source coming from the center. We've managed to zero it and it's very exciting. Let's see what happens over the next few days. After checking zero on everything, we did want to push the ranges out. 
put out two gongs, uh, one gong around 400 yards or meters, one gong around 700 meters, and um, match shot with these 300 on at 400, on at 700, no problems, that went very well. Within like a six inch vital zone at 700, shot for shot, basically just getting the shots like pretty much right on top of each other, so it went well. Center, eh? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see center, come and have a look at that. Eh? <laughs> That's good enough for me. I took out my 300 just for a bit of a comparison between the two. My rifle being on the heavier end of the spectrum, Matt's being a little bit lighter. We compared the two. My rifle was more of like a an all-purpose rifle. It's a little bit lighter. It's heavy enough to be a great long-range setup, but. Um, also light enough to walk around with a bit, whereas Nico's rifle is very much aimed purely towards long range shooting. It's heavier, shooting heavier bullets at a slightly slower speed, and it was cool to just compare both setups. Um, Nico's rifle is probably better suited to the ranges we were shooting at on that day, but um, I could see he was happy with the way mine was shooting as well, which was awesome. So I felt confident going into the days to follow. Right, well, this is pretty cool because Nico is actually the guy that inspired me to buy a, a 300 WSM. We did our Vapor Trail shoot uh, a few years back and I just saw what those rifles were doing at long range and the knockdown power and, you know, you're getting sort of performance very close to a 300 Win Mag with a lot less recoil. Obviously, we're not going to actively try and take longer shots, but it's very likely that we're going to have to. Took our rifles out, this is 700 meters, so 765 yards. Uh, these are my three shots here. Then we took, I think Nico took that shot with my rifle. And then these are two shots with Nico's rifle. So I would say that's 100% spot on. If this was a Kudu standing broadside, even the worst shot of these would have put it down pretty much on the spot. So really happy with that. And that was with a, what, a nine, eight, nine mile an hour wind from from the side over a valley so super super happy and we are ready for this week It was very clear in the morning that we probably didn't get up as early as we should have. Um, we got up at five o'clock, which in the middle of the normal hunting season in the winter in South Africa would have been early enough. But because the whole season, season had been pushed a bit later due to uh, coronavirus lockdowns and stuff like that, it was actually very light when we got up already. This time of year, the kudu are a little bit more difficult to hunt. They've moved off from the cows and uh, the bulls are, big bulls are on their own and uh, some of the bulls from bachelor groups. So we're hoping to get out early this morning now and sit and wait for them to sun themselves and see if we, we can chance our luck on a nice, nice bull for Matt, yeah. When we started driving down into the valley, which takes some time because it's a big property, um, the sun was already coming out, the, the animals were already moving and it's not the kind of hunting we want to, we don't want to stung, stumble across animals, we actually want to be quiet and, and sit down and watch them moving from one place to another. We don't want to ha have to stumble upon them and take a quick shot. So I think maybe our strategy was a little bit off on day one, but nonetheless we, we did our best to, to make the most of it. 
um, it's nice to actually move towards a viewpoint where you've got a, a nice view of where you expect the animals may be and to set up in a position where you can just sit, put your rifle down, check atmospheric conditions, take out binoculars and rangefinder, glass for movement. If you spot an animal that is potential to shoot, to actually look at its horn size, see, okay, how old is it? Is it, is it what we're looking for? And to have time and to do things properly. All right, so we've spotted uh, a kudu up there. And it's a nice opportunity for us to go uh, take a chance on it. I've actually got the, the tripod out, the sentinel tripod, because it's possible that we're gonna have to take a pretty steep shot and it's just not easy to do with a bipod or, or sitting down or something like that. So yeah, probably sitting with the tripod, but let's see. We may not get the opportunity, but it's worth a try. To me, Natal and the Eastern Cape are the two hunting areas that just offer the most, you know, you go out to some other provinces, it's very uniform, everything looks the same. Um, there's one type of hunting that happens and, and that's it. Where Eastern Cape and KZN offer, or Zululand specifically, offer the whole package. Mountains, plains, uh, diversity and species, I think better than most of the other provinces. Natural forests, uh, very thick like woodland type stuff, bush pakinyala hide in there. Um, on the crowns is some clip springer and obviously the baboons and then up on the rolling flats we get the mountain reed buck, common reed buck, um, some blessed buck, some blue wildebeest. Uh, one minute you down in the thorn felt, it's really hot, there's barely any wind and the next moment you're up on the plains and you can see the mist and the clouds rolling in and it's about four or five degrees cooler than, than the place you were like half an hour before. I've always been a sucker for the spiral horned antelope Kudu, Nyala, Bushbuck, uh, just th probably three of my, my favorite antelope species to hunt. Really majestic, elusive, um, and yeah, just beautiful. And tasty, <laughs> very tasty. We actually spotted a group pretty early. Um, we parked off near the bottom of a valley and started walking up this old farm road up to the top of this, this hill and started glassing around, saw some movement, saw some kudu, watched them for a while, but none of them were, were shootable animals. There were some young bulls there and some, you know, some cows, but, but nothing else. So we kind of aborted on that stalk and turned around, took the long trek back down to the vehicle and, and moved on to a different spot. Well, still looking for that kudu. Uh, it's getting hot very quickly. It's just a reminder of, uh, you know, while you don't normally hunt this time of the year and onward in South Africa, it just gets, it just gets too unbearably hot. Um, it's probably nearing nine o'clock now, but it feels like it's midday. It's, the sun's really beating down. We've seen some, some decent animals. We saw some, some kudu earlier. We've seen some nyala walking around. We've just been going after a kudu now and kind of driving around a bit and then walking up some hills. But yeah, unfortunately they're just getting away from us, but that's how hunting goes. Hopefully we can, uh, get on something a bit later and, and take a shot. We moved on to another spot that looked pretty promising, parked off, set up in a nice position, started glassing and just everything seemed to happen at once. We heard commotion down below, we suddenly saw just loads of kudu, probably 15 kudu just make their way up the other side of the valley. There were so many big bulls in that group that I actually couldn't even focus on one of them to, to look, you know. I was looking through the scope, hit record on the scope cam, so you guys will see some pretty incredible footage of those kudu running up the hill. But it all happened so quickly and they didn't stop. I just didn't feel comfortable lobbing a bullet across a valley at, at a few hundred meters without having time to set up properly. Um, you know, I wanted a nice animal, but I didn't want to take it in a risky way or an unethical way. I wanted to do it properly. We packed up everything we needed, we started on a very long and, and difficult hike down the valley, slipping on rocks on the way down, cutting our legs open on, on thorns, having to kneel down almost to get the rifle underneath the bushes where it got thick, and then all the way up the other side of the valley, then down a valley, then up a valley. Um, to be honest, I, it got to a point, and I didn't tell anyone this at the time, but it got to a point where I was so dreading having to recover a dead animal 
from that position and walk all the way back with all that meat that I actually didn't want to see the kudu. Well, after we spotted that, that big herd with all those nice bulls, we decided to go on foot through the valley up the hill and try and follow them. Um, but easier said than done. <laughs> it's really hot, which really doesn't help. And this gun, I tell you now, great for long range shooting, but not fun for carrying through thick vegetation. I've had to duck a few times and my shoulder hurts a bit from carrying it, but we'll press on, we'll try to get something and I think it'll be worth it if we can because there's were some really nice pools there. Like, yeah, it's rare to see so many nice kudu in one group like that. As you may have guessed, um, all those beautiful kudu bulls just vanished into thin air as they normally do. They were probably sitting in a thick bush just watching us, but they're so elusive, we, you know, they disappeared. We weren't going to find them again. And to be honest, after that, I felt a little bit disheartened, just knowing that we'd seen so many and, and not got an opportunity. It made me think, you know, are we even going to get opportunities like this again? We decided to take a bit of a lunch break and reset. We headed down to the valley where Nico has a really beautiful lodge in, in the bushes and decided to have some lunch there. As we were coming down the hill that leads to the valley where the camp was, uh, there's a big dam down there and a big open field where you know, at the back where the grass grows behind the dam where it's nice and moist and the animals come down there to feed. Um, there were some cattle down there feeding that lived down there and in amongst the cattle we saw a group of impala. In the herd there was a, a ram that we could really see that was past its prime. It had started losing condition. And there were a few younger rams in the herd and we knew that there's a follow-up ram for him. Stopped the vehicle probably about a kilometer away, went in on foot got a good stalk in, set up nicely and Matt got a nice shot um, along the side of the dam down onto the Impala. Uh, it was pretty straightforward, the animals weren't spooked, they were 300 and something meters away, 350, 360 meters away, so I could lie prone, set up my bipod and sandbag, range, check the wind, uh, check all the atmospheric conditions, dial, and it was just a matter of taking my time and squeezing the trigger and that ram dropped on the spot. Ready there? That's my first antelope with the scope camera. Super happy with that. Yo, Impala Ram, 367 meters. Uh, Nico told me that they were looking for one for, for meat for somebody. So it's an awesome opportunity, beautiful location here at the dam. Could lie prone, set up properly. It's only like 1.6 mils elevation. So pretty straightforward, a little bit of wind from the left and Lined up, heart and lung shot. Uh, it would have been nice to get a head or neck shot for the meat, but at this distance, I wouldn't want to really want to risk that. But yeah, straight down, super happy. 300 is doing its job perfectly. Unfortunately, my scope cam had a little bit of a gap in it, so the one side is a bit vignetted, but uh, we still got a nice crisp image in the center, and he went absolutely straight down. So really happy with that. It's my first uh, antelope hunt with this rifle and with the uh with an element scope it's the element uh, nexus it's performing really well i'm i'm enjoying how how well it handles uh lens flare we have difficult light conditions here and uh, even without a sunshade it's doing really well and as you'll see in the footage it, it looks really crisp so really happy uh, first animal down i think the next few days are going to be really awesome but let's go for lunch and uh let's get some some rest before we head out again
with the drama of the morning's events starting to get to us, we decided to head down to the camp for a lunch and a short respite from the sun. The camp kind of has everything you need to, to stay there when you're hunting. It's got some beds, like a typical lodge has ablution facilities, cooking facilities, but we weren't interested in, in all of that. We just wanted some shade <laughs> and a place to cook some, some lunch. Um, and that's exactly what we did. And it was cameras off while we sat down, relaxed, rehydrated, and got ready for a busy afternoon. We decided to switch things up a little bit for the afternoon. Um, had a choice between continuing to pursue the, the kudu or trying something different. And we eventually decided to head up to the top of the hill, um, different part of the property, um, where it was a little bit cooler, just because of the altitude, it's normally like three or four degrees cooler up there, and a little bit greener, and just a whole home to a whole lot of different species and a, a totally different landscape. You would hardly even recognize it as the same property if you had to see pictures of the two spots, even though they're right next to each other. I consider myself a variety hunter. I've done some trophy hunts. I've obviously done a lot of meat hunts, cull hunts, but for me, I think the fun in it is being able to pursue and shoot different animals from different areas and, and seeing their different, the different ways that they behave and their different quirks, the different methods you need to use to actually track them down and hunt them obviously just tasting different meats as well that's all part of the experience for me and one animal that i really wanted to get while up there in zululand was a reed buck a common reed buck i know it's i say common but it's actually the the less common um, for me out of the reed buck species we get mountain reed buck in the eastern cape um, you shouldn't confuse the two um, the mountain reed buck are different they live in sort of drier areas um, high hills in the eastern cape we have a ton of them out in the eastern cape i've i've shot a couple before actually i shot one on a previous vapor trails episode with nico a nice big mountain reed buck the common reed buck you need a permit to shoot them in kuzuru natal and you hardly ever find them in the eastern cape um, so nico was able to organize a permit for me which was fantastic it was something that i was really excited about so we decided okay Kudu, we can leave for another day. Let's go after the reed buck. And uh, Nico took me to an area where he'd seen a lot of them. Now, just my luck. <laughs> While I was there over the next few days, um, we really struggled to find a good reed buck ram. And there were lots. It was just, it just happened to be that they weren't out at the time. Uh, and I'm actually going to talk about the reed buck hunt at a later stage. So I'm not going to talk about it now, but while pursuing that reed buck that afternoon we saw so many different species so it was almost like a game drive and in that sense it was totally worth it um, didn't get any reed buck but we saw lots of mountain reed buck we saw zebra we saw bless buck we saw impala we even got to see a, a secretary bird which is is pretty rare to see it's a kind of iconic bird of south africa they look for snakes and then they trample the snakes to death and eat them. Um, it's something that I haven't seen in person yet, but it was nice to see those, those birds there in their natural habitat. So I would say it was, it was still a, a fun afternoon despite not getting anything down. After an afternoon that, that wasn't too strenuous, I, I still had some energy left in me. So Nico and I decided to try for that bush pig. Um, we'd set up the thermal scope earlier, so we were all ready. Quickly shot home, fetched the rifle with the thermal, and we were out to do some bush pig hunting. There's a bit of a backstory to the bush pig hunt. I would actually call the bush pig my nemesis animal. I have tried so many times, but I've, I've always been outwitted. I've been on, on bush pig hunts with other people that were successful. I filmed a bush pig hunt with a FX Royale Aerogun a few years ago with um, Protea cricket player Quinton de Kock, uh, which came out awesome. I have been on bush pig hunts with my cousin in, in previous episodes where, where we didn't get anything. I've been out on bush pig hunts by myself numerous times without having any luck. A bush pig should not be confused with a warthog. They are totally different animals. 
warthog, as you all know, is, is Pumba from the Lion King. Uh, you find them during the day, they sit in the sun and wallow in water holes and roll in the mud and sleep in the shade. And I would say they're very easy to hunt compared to, compared to a bush pig. I do know in, in, in some areas where they do crop damage and stuff like that, they, and if they're really pressured, they'd become animals that move around more at night. But the general rule of thumb is warthog hunted in the day, the animals that move around in the day, they sleep at night. Bush pig is kind of more in the, the mold of a, of a European wild boar or a feral hog. They like to come out at night. You very, very rarely see them during the day. They're very clever. They've got a fantastic sense of smell. Uh, they can hear very well. Um, and they, they're creatures of habit. So in preparation for this hunt, Nico set up a trail cam. Um, he put bait down. You can put out a carcass or you can put out some, some rotting food of some sort and they come and they eat the worms out of it. And in order to get a bush pig to come in, you've got to be very methodical. You've got to put it up every night for a very long time until you start to see them coming in regularly on the trail cam. And that's what Nico did. He was sending me pictures from the trail cam weeks in advance before I hunt saying, okay, Matt, they're coming in. Um, he had everything planned so well. And th that is part of the fun in bush pig hunting is that it is very difficult. They call it a, a poor man's leopard because as with a the leopard, they are everywhere, but you just don't see them. They're in the bushes all over the place, but you will not see them unless you put a trail cam up and prepare for that hunt weeks in advance. And this was going to be my night. <laughs> Right, so we're just setting up on the on the, the, the bush pigs. We've got some bait probably 35, 40 meters away. And uh, it's starting to cool down now, so getting my, my jacket on. Um, we're going to be using the 260. You would have seen some footage of us uh, setting up the thermal scope. It's an ATN Mars. It looks really, really nice. I had an Excite before, which is a infrared unit but this is thermal which is something really really cool and the best thing is that we'll be recording straight from this so you'll be seeing that footage but let's get comfortable let's get set up and let's wait for them to come in it could be an hour it could be two hours we don't know it could be even more than that i knew bush pigs were creatures of habit but i was totally blown away by just the the precision of that animal's body clock and um, nico looked at his watch Eventually he said, get ready Matt, because they're going to come in in the next few minutes. And they literally came in a few minutes later. Uh, I could hardly believe it. Initially we just saw a few feral cats and stuff come in and I thought, Ugh, you know, feral cats are probably the only thing we're going to see this evening. But right on cue, heard a bit of noise coming through the brush. And the next thing I know, I see that heat source in the thermal coming into view and my heart started beating. Nothing can prepare you for the adrenaline of having that pig come in and that's one of the excitements of it you talk about buck fever pig fever is something very special as well i obviously wanted to go for the big boar i knew that i may not get more than one shot uh, as an opportunity so i wanted to go for the big boar and i couldn't make out much detail on the on the thermal i could just see the outline of the animal one thing i looked at was size but the other thing i looked at was the shape of the animal's face the boar had these big ears that curled back, these sharp ears. Um, you could see those warts on its face. You could tell it was a monster. And after probably 30 or 40 seconds of actually just waiting to see if, of a, if a bigger one would come in, I decided to take my opportunity. Um, I had a round in the chamber ready. I put the bolt down, um, put that crosshair right on the animal's head and just squeeze the trigger and thump, he went straight down. And it almost took me a moment to realize, oh wow, okay, that some of them are staying around. So I put another one in the chamber and took another shot at a smaller one, knowing that the smaller one would probably be the tastier of the two. And that was that. <laughs> oh my word. <laughs> that happened so quickly. I can feel I'm starting to shake now. <laughs> 
so the first one came in basically you know we saw the trail cam footage showing that they've come in about quarter past seven it's probably about ten past seven quarter past seven now and they came in like exactly like clockwork um yeah there were probably about four or five pigs there and i could actually see the the big board that we saw on camera so i took my time waited for a pretty good angle took a headshot reloaded quickly got an opportunity on another one two headshots two pigs down and this is probably my favorite kind of hunting aside from maybe taking a like a good long range shot at a baboon or something this is so exciting so 260's done the job the ATN Mars has done its job I think I've just fallen in love with this little scope <laughs> I'm gonna have to get one now but yeah two pigs down and couldn't be happier. Let's go take a look. Awesome, well done. Thank you. <laughs> so here's the first one. Big boar. Lovely. <laughs> lovely, lovely boar. Eh? Awesome. You can see the baits right down here. So, awesome to get that one down. I'm glad I did get the boar. It's hard to tell through the thermal without yeah. seeing the detail, but I saw the shape over here. Awesome, awesome boar. Eh? Those lumps good. there and then Here's the smaller one, yeah. Check it the warts on this, okay. Smaller both one, yeah. Both the boars. Is it? That's the okay. that's a dark boar. And then this one back here is the white boar. Awesome. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I realized how big of a deal it was that I that I'd got that big boar down until I actually walked up to it and, and saw the you know the big eyes on the on the farm workers that were there and the smile on Nico's face you know these are the guys that had, had been preparing for this for a long time I think they were excited to see that their plan worked but also a little bit blown away by the size of that ball um, and to get it on the first night you know that doesn't happen all the time so I, I was very very grateful at that time that I, I'd got that opportunity and you know as we loaded them up into wheelbarrows and started taking them back towards the the cold room up the hill um, just I was completely elated and my tiredness from early in the day had completely disappeared and was replaced with, I'd say, adrenaline. <laughs> it was very cool. Well, I don't, I don't even know what to say or where to start because uh, it's quite a, I wouldn't say a dream of mine, but it's, a, it's been a goal of mine for a very long time to get a nice big bush pig on bait. I guess first and foremost I just want to thank uh, Nico Harris who invited me out here just such an awesome guy you know we are here because we're friends with each other and we, we just want to have a good time together but he's gone so out of his way to make sure that I have a good time he's been an amazing host he's been uh, baiting these pigs in for for weeks making sure that that you know when the time comes now for us to hunt that they're coming in regularly at the right time and I'll tell you that's not easy to do those of you who know bush pigs know how, how elusive they are and how smart they are and Nico really went out of his way to make sure that that we got these tonight so the credit mustn't go to me who only had to take a shot from from 35 meters um, but the credit must go to Nico who's who's done a fantastic job um, and then other other people I want to thank um, ECM and uh, ATN who organized this uh, thermal unit for me it's a loan unit they sent to me and said hey, I must try it out I absolutely love it so thanks guys it's something that I'm gonna have to look at in the future because this was a, a real awesome experience um, and also want to thank uh, Splitting Image Taxidermy who just sponsored some of the clothing I've been using over the last few days just really high quality stuff awesome stuff and I'm probably gonna use them to get this one uh, mounted over here because you, you don't often come across a bush pig this size but yep we're gonna call it tonight it's been a long uh, very tiring day a lot of heat uh, I'm, I feel like I'm wide awake now that we've got these down but I think let's get an early night and let's hit it hard tomorrow and see if we can get something else down we took the two bush pigs to the cold room and, and hung them up and weighed them uh, the big boar weighed 85 kilograms um, you know they do get a bit bigger than that but I would say I realized that a boar that big you don't always get opportunities like that and it may be the only boar I shoot in that kind of size category so I, I saved at the moment I've got some nice pictures with it and 
he'll be he'll be going up on my wall at my house for sure <laughs> from there cameras went off had a quick dinner and we went straight to bed preparing for the very early start at 4 a.m the next morning going after mr kudu 